We're ecstatic to be here this morning in the presence of God. I love the fact that it doesn't matter where we are, he shows up. And it's an amazing thing. Um, as we were discussing earlier, me and in a text message group, did anybody else feel like daylight savings time hit him like a linebacker crossing the middle of the field this morning? Like when I got up this morning, the sun, I mean, I got up early, right? And the sun kind of, you know, wasn't up yet. And I like praying when it's, when it's dark, but I went outside and I'm like, good Lord, I am exhausted and I don't feel like I should be. But let me get my, my table over here. But if you're here for the first time this morning, I want to welcome you. My name is Pastor Chris. I'm the lead pastor here at the Tabernacle. We are excited that you came to be with us today. If it is your first time, we have a gift for you. If you go to the hub in the front, I think it's in the front. I think they moved it on me because there's construction out front. Normally a pastor apologizes, like pardon our mess, but it's not our mess, so don't blame us. Um, but we're glad you're here this morning. If it is your first time, we have a gift for you. We'd love to just connect with you and get you to know you better because you could have went a bunch of different places, but you chose to come here, and we're thankful for that. As our ushers come this morning, we're going to take our tithe and offering this morning. And I want to encourage you to keep believing and keep praying and keep pressing and keep giving because God's moving. Amen. Amen. Over the next several weeks and months, you're going to be hearing testimony after testimony after testimony of what God is doing in the finances of the people that are giving into this ministry. Because I believe God's hand is on us at this moment. And I'm excited to see what he does. Amen. So, Father, I thank you this morning for your presence. I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, that you've given seed to the sower and you allow us to partner with you. So, God, I ask that you would, you would take this, multiply it 30, 60, and 100 times over, that we would be blessed to be a blessing, to be an advance your kingdom. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. Two little quick things before I move into my message, even to, to the chagrin of Matt Snyder. Tomorrow night we have prayer. At the church at, at 6.30 to 8. It's going to be phenomenal. Do not miss it. We're praying in the building. I know there's no air. It's okay. Don't wear a sweatshirt. You'll be fine. But I'm believing God's going to move. And then if you have any questions about our missions trip this fall to Guatemala, please see Pastor Melanie. Here. Please see Pastor Melanie before you leave today. Amen? Amen? Amen. Well, I'm looking forward to today's message. I feel like I haven't preached in like 100 years. It's only been one week, but no, it's been two weeks. I don't even remember. Anyway, it feels like it's been a while. And I'm excited this morning because we get to speak. I get to speak today on the Building Legacy Series. It's what we're into right now with our capital campaign. How many of you were excited last week? I was excited last week because I love the fact that God said, I'm going to use and when God of all creation decides he wants to use me for something, I get excited about it. Amen? And so we're talking about building a legacy. And over the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about legacy and, and, and doing what God told us to do and be obedient. On April 15th, we're going to be coming together on a Saturday night to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the tabernacle. We're going to have some, some guests come from way back that I don't think any, most of y'all don't even know. Um, but I got, to, I got to tell you something I learned about our history that I think is just phenomenal. So in the late 70s, the guest speaker on that weekend, April 15th and 16th, in the late 70s, we had an associate pastor here, and I'm going to say this on purpose. We had an African-American so associate pastor in St. Bernard Parish in the 70s. Not like 2007, like 1970-something. And if you were around back then, it's a big deal. You're around today, it's a big deal. And uh, his name is Brother T., for the Theodore Hughes. He's going to be with us that weekend. We're going to be celebrating the legacy that God has already built and laid over the last 50 years because I believe that when we give honor to where honor is due, he can trust us to keep going forward. Amen? So this morning, I'm excited to dive into the Word today. And in the Word, there are multiple building campaigns that are discussed. There are multiple building projects, but there are four that are more prominent. There's one in Exodus. There's one in First Chronicles. There's one in Ezra and Nehemiah, and then there's another one in Haggai and some other in the Minor Prophets. And I'm going to be pulling from these over the next few weeks to really show you that God is in things like a building campaign. A lot of times we, we get a little too spiritual for our own good, and we think that God doesn't care about these things. Where I, I, I think if you read Scripture, you, it's very evident that he cares. And so I'm excited to go through that journey with you. If you would open your Bibles... The first Chronicles chapter 29, and we're going we're gonna to leave it there for a minute, and we're going to just give you some background and stuff like that. Pray with me real quick. Heavenly Father, 
I thank you that you're with me today, that you're going to speak through me, and then in my own opinion, but all of you. I pray that every person on the sound of my voice will leave this place changed, wanting and knowing you more, and that we would encounter you in a new way as we embark on this journey together, building a legacy for you and your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 1 says, Furthermore, King David said to all the assembly, My son Solomon, whom alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced. And the work is great because the temple is not for man, but for the Lord God. Now it came to pass, sorry, that's the other verse. Furthermore, King David said to all the assembly, My son Solomon, who alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced, and the work is great. Because the temple is not for man, but for the Lord God. This is King David at the end of his life. And in 2 Samuel chapter 7, which you don't have to put it up, I'm not going to read it. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, it begins to describe that King David had a burden to build the house of God. Because at the time, David, his palace was built. He was living in in a beautiful palace that that was really world-renowned. And he gets convicted because he's living in this gorgeous palace, and yet the, the, the presence of God, the tabernacle of God, was still with curtains. It was still the same model they used in the Old Testament. And this really began to grieve David, because in his mind, he was, in his, he was living in a better situation than the house of God was. And he begins to be very grieved, and he begins to have a burden to rebuild the house, or to build God a temple, a permanent home to dwell in. He, and he has this desire, and as he begins to pursue God and go after God to figure out how and when and what he should do, the Lord stops him. And in First Chronicles 28, we see that David is actually told, you cannot build this temple for me because you've been in too many battles. you fought too many wars, and there's too much blood on your hands but your son Solomon is going to do it. And so King David, who's a man after God's own heart, who's my favorite Old Testament character, he's the, the, uh, I've read so much about him. My life was modeled after him. My mom used to pray that I was like King David and things like that. So maybe that's where the red beard comes from. I'm not sure. But this is something that I, I've been very interested in because when I read it, he says, no, you can't build it. Your son has to. And Sam's real little, so I'm like, okay, that can't be what the context is. we got to figure this out a little bit. And as I began to to really dive into this, the Lord began to show me why, exactly why, he's doing what he's doing now. And so when you go back to 1 Chronicles 29, furthermore, King David said to all the assembly, my son Solomon, whom alone God has chosen, is young and experienced. The work is great because the temple is not for man but for the Lord God. I'm going to give you three things this morning on how I know that God is in this and God is moving right now. The first one that we have to see and learn is that God chooses the builders. God chooses the builders. David announces to the nation and to the leaders of Israel that Solomon is the one who's going to build it. That's the one that God chose. This church has been around for 50 years, but for some reason, God decided that I would be the one to pastor it in this particular moment. Now, trust me, I have already done the logistical gymnastics of why me, and it should have been this one, or it could have been that one, or I've done, I've already done that. I've done that for for hours. But the bottom line is God said, no, I'm choosing this one. And then notice what he says next. He says, Solomon, my son, whose God has chosen, is young and inexperienced. Now, if you know anything about me, I'm the worst thing that has ever happened to your toolbox. It's horrible. I've told this story before. I had a a deadbolt get stuck on a door, my side door of my house. And I fought it. I'm not even kidding you. I fought it for about three hours. And after I lost my salvation and repented about five times, I called Pastor Jarrett, and I said, bro, I need help. He's like, what? I'm like, I'm about to lose my mind. He's like, why? My door, my, my deadbolt is stuck. He comes down to my house, gets out. He on, he's on the phone. I didn't get off the phone. He's on the phone, and in less than 60 seconds, my door is fixed. Now, needless to say, I don't think I've called him again for an issue because I'm still embarrassed from that particular encounter. 
But it is very safe to say that I can relate to Solomon in this moment because Solomon was young and inexperienced. And, and, and David points this out to the nation of Israel that Solomon, whom God has chosen. you got to realize that. God chose. You may be sitting here today and you'll be saying, Pastor Chris, God telling me to do something. I don't know why he's telling me. Stop asking why and just rejoice to the fact that God chose you. Do you realize that Moses had a stutter? Like, like I'm, 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 I'm going to pre pre preach. Like Moses had a speech impediment. It was a stutter. And yet Moses was the guy picked to stand before the single most powerful man on the planet, Pharaoh, and declare, let my people go. So one of the biggest, I'm going to tell you, gonna, this isn't in my notes. I'm just kind of going in for a minute. One of the biggest mistakes Christians make is disqualify themselves from what God has picked them to do. See, God knows exactly what he's doing because God knit you together in your mother's womb and he saw your, your, your purpose. He saw your substance while yet being unformed. Psalm 139. He knew what you were called to do before he put you in a body. So I have always taught that my weaknesses were created just as much as my strengths. God knew that under no circumstances could he allow me to be able to dance. Because I could sing and play music. And if I could dance, my ego wouldn't be able to fit in the room. And I'd try to be some superstar. So he's like, you, I need you to play and sing, but you will not be allowed to dance. And you can try, and they will make fun of you, and you can have fun doing it, but you will not have the ability to dance. And I watch other people dance, and I'm like, God, that's what I think I'm doing. Like, I'm telling my legs to do that, and they will not do it. It's not fair. And then one, there's, there's a video. I believe it was from Corey and Mary's wedding where Cody Cliff and I do this random impromptu dance. And when you see the video, we look in sync. But it was taking 110% of my brain capacity and athletic ability to do the simple little move that Cody would do in his sleep. It's just not fair. I don't know why. And he's got the hair. It's just not fair, right? I don't understand but God chose. Say, God chose me. Y'all sound so unbelievably convinced that God chose you. You know why? Because you're not. You don't think God chose you. You don't think you have anything worth being chosen for. You don't think that there's any reason that God would ever choose you. God would just choose that one. God could choose, this person would be so much better at it than me. This person would be so much more efficient at it than me. God didn't choose me. God, God wouldn't want to use me for that. Why in the world would he pick me for that? But it says here, David announced to the nation of Israel, my son Solomon, whom God has chosen. If there's anything you leave today knowing for certain is that God has chosen you to be a part of his kingdom in the earth. He's chosen you. No matter what you've done, doesn't matter, it don't even matter what you're doing. I need you to hear me. It doesn't even matter what you're doing right now. You could have been drunk as a skunk last night and hung over right now. And God's like, I'm, I still got a plan. I, you smell funny, but I still got a plan. We, 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 we get this, this thing mixed up. I don't know why I'm going here because it's not in the notes. But uh, we get this, this, this complex where because of what I've done, God can't use me to do what I'd like to do. Because, because of what I've been through, because of what I've walked through, or better yet, because of what was done to me, God could never possibly choose me. God could never possibly use me. Man, have you ever read this thing? Like, there's one thing in common between everybody but Jesus that God chose to do anything is all of them were an absolute disaster in some way, shape, or form. And yet God chose. It says that he chose, and we've got to come to a place where we're so confident in the fact that he chose us. He chose Solomon, who was young and inexperienced. If you do the calculations on what they spend on the first temple, it is a $30 million project in today's money. Chances are no one in this room, in your right mind, is going to give me $30 million to manage any type of construction project. If you're considering it, let me help you. Don't. I'm not the guy to manage and be the contractor for a $30 million project. Yet Solomon is the one that's been chosen 
by God to do this. We're called to build the kingdom. We're called to build the lives of our children. We're called to be an example. We're called to build each other as the body of Christ. And there are times that he calls us to do things like we're doing now, building a structure. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to explain why he chose it in a second, but I just need to make sure we catch one thing. Whether you've been at this church for 50 years or 50 minutes, you were not brought here by accident. You weren't brought here because you saw a post on Facebook and you liked it and you wanted to check us out. You weren't here because you saw me preaching on a clip and you liked my beard. You're not here because you liked the music. You're not here because you've tried all the other churches and that one didn't work. You are here because before the foundation of the world was laid, God decided that he wanted you here in March of 2023. And he has been steering the course of your life Ever since you became to be to get you to this moment. Because God has something in you that this mission and this body and this church needs. And he has been steering this all through the course of your life. Man, Pastor Chris, I'd have been so much better if I'd have been here 20 years ago. Exactly. That's why he didn't send you here 20 years. Because, see, not only does God choose the builders... God chooses the project. Back in 1 Chronicles 21, 9, it says, My son Solomon, whom God alone has chosen, is young and experienced, and the work is great. The work is great. Now, the work is great. When you look up that word in the Hebrew, it literally means that the work is great, which is large, intense, and important. So let's think about this decision for a moment that God made. God picks a young and inexperienced man who's never led anything to do a building project that will cost $30 million that is intense and large. In my mind, that is not a very effective leadership decision. Like if John Maxwell was to critique God on his decision in First Chronicles 29, he would not get a good grade because it doesn't make sense. But see, God doesn't just choose the builder. God chooses the project. So God picked Solomon, who knew nothing and was inexperienced, and then picked this massive project for Solomon to do. Do you know why? See, there's this rule about the kingdom that none of us like to admit because it removes all excuses. I'm gonna let you like I'm coming, I'm coming at you right now. It removes all of our excuses. This one rule is that God, in every situation that we ever encounter and we ever find ourselves in, He is always looking to extract the most amount of glory for Himself as possible. Always. And in order for Him to do that in the most effective way, is to put us. In the most ridiculous situations that make no sense on paper, that make less than sense on paper, and say, yeah, I'm going to use that guy for that exact situation. Doesn't make any sense. Why, God? Like, Pastor Carl, my pastor, can build a house with toothpicks, bubble gum, and a piece of cheese. Like, it's unbelievable the, the, the handyman construction skill that the man has. I will take three times as long as you to screw a screw into the wall. And it's going to be crooked. And you're going to be mad at me anyway. But God chooses the builder and he chooses the project. And it tells us why he does this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 and 10, where it says, and he said to me, this is Paul writing, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, and my strength is made, what's that next word y'all say? What's it, what is it? Perfect. Not stronger. Not improved. Perfect. In weakness. Therefore, I most gladly... I will rather boast in my affirmities that the power of Christ 
may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, green stuff, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, he is strong. He is strong. Now, I don't know about you, but I do not go around all day looking for places that I'm weak. Like, I don't drive around trying to find cars I can fix. Like, oh, your transmission's shot? I'm on my way. I don't do that. Oh, your air conditioner's not working. Psh, let, me put my, let me finish this sandwich, and I am on my way. I am coming. I don't do that. What we tend to do, or if what I would tend to do is, oh, you have a piano that hasn't played in a while. I'm your guy. You need me to sing. Got it. You need me to maybe motivate some people, maybe give a public address or speech or something. I'm your guy. I got you. But we don't go around looking for weaknesses. When this verse literally says that if I'm, Paul says, if I'm going to boast in anything, let it be in my weakness. If I'm a boast in anything, let it be in my weakness. Have you ever asked the question, why, Pastor Chris, why when I read books and why when I hear testimonies on YouTube or, or people of doing these amazing things for God, it never happens to me? You ever ask yourself that question? I'm going to give you the answer. It's because you avoid your weaknesses too much. You don't put yourself, allow yourself to be put in a place where you're weak. You know where you feel weak? In a room with someone dying of cancer. You know where you feel insignificant? Running up to a car accident right after it happened to begin helping and begin praying for people. You know when you feel insignificant? When you're sitting at your kitchen table and a marriage is falling apart. And you're the one that they've come to to try and fix it. You know when you feel insignificant? When you can barely label the tools in a toolbox and God asks you to build a $2 million building project on a building that's falling apart. You'll, that's, that's when you'll feel weak. But it's in those very moments where his power is made perfect. If I told you that, listen, if you did this, you would be perfect. You, you, would, you would put yourself in a position, and if you did just it, you would be perfect at something. We'd all sign up to do it. Do you realize that God is waiting for people to trust him enough to open up their weaknesses, to expose their weaknesses, and say, God, I am jacked up in this area. I cannot do this on my own, but I will do whatever you tell me so you can get the most glory out of me in the middle of this jacked up situation. And there are not enough believers who are willing to say, I'll be weak. I'll be weak. We don't do that. That's why we take 47 selfies and only post one of them. we got to pick the best one to get posted. That's why we pay wedding photographers, and they take 300 pictures and, like, 32 make the book. Because everything's got to be perfect. We have to show our strengths. We have to show our good side. Ladies, have you ever had your husband invite somebody over and didn't tell you until they were coming over? I did that Friday. Friday or Thursday. Why did I do it? I don't remember. Friday. When did y'all come over? Friday? Yeah, I did that Friday. Like, hey, Matt's got some friends in from out of town. Everybody say hi, by the way. Gavin and Amy, hello. Anyway. And, and, and they wanted to come stop by and meet Caitlin. Caitlin, Friday mornings are bakery days. Like, my house turns into a bakery. My kitchen is a bakery on Friday mornings. We go have a breakfast date, and then she goes home and becomes Mrs. Pillsbury. That's just what she does, right? And I'm on this diet, right, so I can't eat the stuff anymore. So it's basically like active torture every Friday at my house. Pray for me on Fridays if you can. Anyway, and I'm like, I, we come back from, oh, hey, Matt's going to stop by with their friends. And he, she's like, now? And I'm like, yeah. Is that a problem? And she's like, well, I mean, look at the house. Isn't it? Guys, why? Why? This is not in my notes either. I don't know why I'm saying this. Maybe it's going to bring freedom to somebody. Hallelujah. Why is one pillow, pro pillow, on the wrong 
cushion of the couch. The end of the world. Right? I mean, I am here to make throw pillows illegal. Like, I want to, f- I'd run for president on that be one of my campaign pledges to make them illegal in the country. They're literally the dumbest things that's ever been created, right? But, anyway, I digress. We had a couple of pajamas on the ground, the kids that morning, probably a piece of toast or a pancake or something somewhere on the floor, you know how kids are. And I'm like, she's like, they're coming over now? I'm like, yes, we have to clean up. I'm like, yeah, that's what we got to do. Let's do it. Well, I'm baking. Well, I'll do it. Well, you don't do it right. (laughs) And they came over, and we had a good time, and it was great, right? But I I, I make that joke because everybody can relate to it. But why is it that every time God asks us to do something, we go, wait, stop, the throw pillars are off. Wait, wait, stop, there's clothes on the floor in my heart. Wait, 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 wait. I had a bad attitude with my spouse yesterday. I can't possibly teach life group tonight. I, I, I didn't manage my money well, and I, I'm a little behind that I got to really tighten it up, and I had to borrow some from savings. And so, so, God, I can't, I can't possibly be used to pray at the altar this weekend. I'm just, it's, just un, it's just not tidy. No, if my toilet was spewing water all over the house, we're like, Matt, it's probably not a good time, unless he's a plumber, Right? But chances are that's not the case. But the reality is, is we will find every little bitty tiny reason to tell God we can't do something. But we'll never miss the ballpark. We'll never miss dance practice. We'll never miss anything our kids have or the commitments we've made. But God forbid God says, hey, be here and do this for me. It's true. It's like human. We won't do that. I don't want to be weak. I don't want to look weak. When God is like, oh, if you would just be weak for a moment, you would see my power displayed in a way that you can only dream about. <clears throat> Pastor Chris, I don't have, we've been praying, my wife and I have been praying, we've got our, our number for the campaign, and I've already, like, written it down, and so that means it's real. Oh, my gosh. Anyway, and I, I'm praying, and I'm, like, going through it, and I've been praying for you as a body because I understand the pressure. Because to my knowledge, there are no millionaires in this congregation. If there are, please see me after service. Um, but just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. That could be taken the wrong way. But I get what it's like, God. How could you use me? I make $36,000 a year. How could you use me to build that building? God, me and my wife, we're, we're, we're paying off bad debt. We're, 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 we're trying to raise the kids. God, like, I could never commit anything of, of substance to that campaign and God's like mm-hmm. I know but it isn't until I say God I'll be weak that's when he says okay now I can be strong see it's God that chooses the builder it's God that chooses the project and the last thing is that God chooses the reason God chooses the reason Back to First Chronicles 1, 29, 1. Furthermore, King David said to all the assembly, my son Solomon, whom alone God has chosen, remember, he chooses. He's young and experienced, and the work is great. It's intense. It's difficult. It's large, which is number two. He chooses the project, and this is the reason, because the temple is not for man, but for the Lord. See, when... When David makes this distinction, he's letting us know. Put that verse up for me again, please. First Chronicles 29, 1 Chronicles 29.1. Notice how it's written. My son, whom God has chosen, shown and experienced, and the work is great. Why did I pick Solomon, who's inexperienced, and the work is great? Because it's not for man. For the Lord. And as I said, we could sit down and we could talk last week. I said, we could talk about how we just got to get back in our building. We could talk about how we just, you know, it just needs to be right. We need to be home, and I get it. We could talk about all the, the reasons that we think of. But you want to know why we're doing this? You want to know why God has put us in this position? You want to know why it matters that we pray and obey? Why it matters that we are faithful to do what God asks us to do? It's because 
it's for him. Why? Because, Pastor Chris, how in the world can a church of our size do a project like this? This is phase one, y'all. Don't get me started on phase four. Where there's a gymnasium on the property. And we're having youth basketball tournaments and John Stogner's running rec leagues out of it and there's life groups after basketball and after cornhole. Don't, don't get me started on phase four. Yo, two million is like the appetizer. But it's not from me. While, yes, I believe that my daughters will be touched, my kids will be touched by the presence of God in that building. They'll get water baptized in that building. They'll get filled with the Holy Spirit, hopefully, in that building. Their husband and their, their wives will get born again and saved in that building in Jesus' name. My grandchildren will be able to grow up in that building in Jesus' name. I'm building a legacy that my grandmother got to sit back and watch for 40 years. I'm going to sit back and watch for 40 years myself, right? That's what I'm doing because I believe God can do it. But that's not even the reason why. The reason why is so that the, whatever the census is for this community can drive by that building and say, Look what God did. Because there is no way that just came out of St. Bernard. It's so that people from the North Shore who are coming down for service can drive down and make this statement. Oh, I can't wait to hear this one. This building don't look like it should be in St. Bernard. This property looks like it should be somewhere. It don't, it don't fit in St. Bernard. No, boo, this is what God intends St. Bernard to be. See, I, I, want, I want it to be to a place to where anyone who drives by says, that's not what Pastor Chris did. Anybody who knows me knows for a fact it ain't what Pastor Chris did. But they can sit there and say, look what God has done. And see, I don't know if you do this, you know, I, I do, because I'm looking at the total number and I'm praying. And so far we've gotten four commitments back plus my wife and I. So there's a lot of people here who I'm still believing God to speak to. And the four commitments I got don't meet the total. And so sometimes I'll lay in bed or I'll be in my office or I'll go in the sanctuary over there and I'll start praying and I'll start getting nervous. But God, this is, this is a big deal here, God. This, this is a big project. And it's phase one. And then phase two is another big deal. And then phase three. God, this is a whole lot. Like, what are you doing? I don't really understand. And you see, I reach this moment where I start to panic and I start to spiral. And I wonder, how is he going to pay for it? And then I look at the, the pledge, the number that God gave my wife and I. And I'm like, God, how are you going to pay for that? I don't, want, I don't have that within me. I don't understand. How are you possibly going to pay for it? And then this little voice on the inside of me says, didn't I already pay for it all? And all I got to do is look to Calvary. Because if he already paid that price, a little building on Paris Road is nothing. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. I can... Rejoice in the fact that I'm born again. I'm filled with this spirit. I can access his presence anytime that I so well choose. And the fact that I can do that is only because of the price that he paid. So now I recognize that every single day I get to experience the confidence that he's going to pay for it. You know why? Because David tells us in First Chronicles 29, it's not for man, but it's for the Lord. If I ask you to come to my house and help me fix something, who's paying for it? Me, because it's not for you, it's for me. And if I ask you to do it, I'm the one that's going to pay for it, right? Common sense. I'm going to let you know, Chris is not asking you to help build that building. God is. And if it's for him, guess who gets to pay for it? God does. But you want to know how he pays for it? Well, that's the cool part. That's, like, that's, the, that's the part that blows our minds, is, is, is God doesn't pay for it. By having somebody find $2 million in a parking lot. He pays for it through my checking account, 
in your checking account. Pastor, because you're talking about money a whole lot. Yeah, I am. I am. Want to know why I am? Because the two things in the world people want more of are the two things the church is most afraid to talk about, sex and money. This is not a pastor who is afraid to talk about the things that people want to talk about. And I want God to blow your minds when it comes to your finances. And I'm letting you know this is an opportunity for you to see him do something that you've never been able to see him do. Because we've never been weaker. And it's because of the weakness that we can see his strength. But see, you may be here, you may be able to say, Pastor Chris, I don't have the assurance that he's going to pay for it. I don't, I don't have that ability to just say, man, you, you, God, are you really going to pay for this? That's because you've never accepted his payment for your sin. Would you bow your heads this morning, please?